you've been brought on for a reason. They hired you for your expertise, so don't doubt it. It's okay to be honest and have those hard conversations up front, and you have to have them or you're never going to build enough trust. I definitely think I would have stepped back and had more of those conversations up front about like, okay, what do we want to achieve? What's keeping us from growing today? And just calling out things that I saw that might have been hindering growth as well. Hello, welcome to the Delivering Value podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Kaplan, and my guest today is Hillary Miller. Hillary works the intersection of growth and product at Whimsical, which is a high volume whiteboarding and collaboration tool. And Whimsical is actually Hillary's second time being a head of growth at an early stage product led organization. So I was excited to have her join the pod to hear about the bumps, bruises, and missteps that she's had along the way in her career. And in our conversation, we talked about how her career has oscillated between marketing and growth. She's actually made that leap two or three times and shared how difficult that can be and some of the challenges associated with making that leap. She's also worked with technical founders, which if you work in growth at an early stage company, you know how difficult and challenging that can be. And Hillary has even worked at a company that hired her to lead growth and then realized that it was too early to scale a cross-functional growth team and asked her to actually transition and lead another department. These are challenges I hear about all the time as someone who coaches people who lead cross-functional growth teams. And so if you are in a role like that, I know that you will enjoy our conversation. Let's jump right in. This episode of the show is brought to you by Mad Kudu. As a former head of growth, my team spent insane amounts of time trying to identify the accounts that were likely to purchase or upgrade based on their behavioral signals. And our business intelligence team spent weeks and weeks analyzing our touch points and trying to predict if an account was likely to convert or not. It was a long and complicated process in the mix of sales-led and product-led motions and touch points made it way harder. Madkudu's revenue automation intelligence helps SaaS companies cut through the noise and brings more focus to revenue and growth teams by predicting and prioritizing the right revenue generating actions. They help SaaS companies with hybrid go-to-market models like the ones I've worked at understand what the data is telling us and what to do with it. If you're interested in learning more, check out madkudu.com slash value. This episode is brought to you by Novatic. If you follow me online, you know how much I believe in the interactive demo space. And that's because if you work at a product-led company that has a free trial or a freemium motion, what you see is usually a high percentage of those new users sign up, poke around for a few minutes, but never really use your product in a meaningful way. It's really frustrating. And when you survey these folks, Usually they'll say, well, I just wanted to see your product in action. I'm not really ready to upload my stuff yet. And I saw this happen firsthand when I was at PostScript and at Wistia. And to solve this problem, we created an interactive version of our tool, an interactive demo. We put it on the website and we saw how effective it was to activate more signups and convert more free users into paying customers. If you're looking for help doing this yourself, check out Novatic. They have a no-code editor to help product-led SaaS companies create and build interactive demos that increase conversions and activations. I recommend them all the time to my advising clients, especially right now as resources are tight and every new account matters. If you're interested in learning more, check out nevatic.com slash value. So where I want to start for today is with your growth origin story. So I'm curious to know, like, what led you into growth? Still relatively new capability, mostly early stage companies, early stage, like forward thinking tech companies that have people like us in house, what led you into this world? It's like not a typical backstory or not like a very linear line to where I got to where I am today. I started off in the agency world 11 years ago, working at a hodgepodge of marketing and product development agencies. And I was working under like the ambiguous title of strategist, which that can mean literally anything. What I was doing was some flavor of growth. You know, I was doing a little bit of marketing, a little bit of product and UX research, a little bit of analytics. So I was swimming around growth, but not functionally working on growth yet, which took me to my first client side role in 2017. I ended up working at a startup called Full Contact on their intelligent cross platform contact management app. And that was my first time working in an actual growth role. They hired me on as a product marketing manager originally, and I did that for about a year, realized that I wasn't really good at the core parts of product marketing, positioning and messaging, content creation, sales enablement, not my thing. And so that came to the point where I had a discussion with my manager and I was like, hey, I'm really stronger at like the gross sides of this role. 
and like the product management side, how can we marry those two? So like I could be better set up for success. And so I ended up working as a growth product manager there. I ended up taking a few interim roles doing growth product, growth marketing. And then I ended up having my first time head of growth role at a company called Fold. That was in 2019, I want to say. I was their ninth hire. I was there for about a year and it was awesome. I mean, it was like my first chance to build a growth team from scratch, set the strategy. I really enjoyed it. And I was actually able to do growth across the full spectrum of growth from nuts to bolts. And then from there, I went to Whimsical and that was my second time working in the head of growth role, which brings me to where I am today. And what did the team look like at Fold? So I know you said you started with nine people and then scaled up from there. When your growth team was up and running, what did that look like? So Fold was really unique in that our primary growth loop was the community-led growth loop, which I feel like that's not super duper common. So we were kind of layering that onto this PLG motion that already existed. So the team kind of ended up taking shape into having more of like a generalist growth marketer on the team and then having like some community oriented folks who are doing community management and enabling this army of influencers and people who just love giving referrals for Fold to work on that. And I know that you said you transitioned from being a product marketer into working for a PM and then having your own opportunity to build and scale your team. I'm curious, was there a moment or a person or someone that kind of opened your eyes that this was a career path that could take you out of marketing and sort of in between is how I think about it a lot of times? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I would say there were a few factors that led me to that. So one was these external influences. At the time, you know, I was like, what the heck am I doing? What is this role? Does this even exist? Is there a need for this? And so I started diving into the Reforge content. I think it was pretty early at the time. And I took a Reforge course and it really resonated with me. That was in 2018, maybe. And I was like, I finally get it. This is what growth is. This is what I want to do. This is what I've been doing. And there's other people that have done it too. There's other me's that are out there. I feel like that's a big part of it, right? It's kind of a lonely role. And sometimes you feel like you're making up the next step as you go. And so it's a big sense of relief. I took Reforged as well. I took it way back in 2015. And I felt the same way. I was like, thank God there's other me's out there. And there's someone who's smarter than me, who's already figured some of this stuff out. And that's really helpful. Yeah, totally. So I would say it was a combination of Reforge. And I learned of some people who had already been working in growth at the time. So like Casey Winters, Andrew Chen and Jeff Chang, I started just diving into their content and consuming all of it and just being like, I can like pattern match with what these guys have already done and learn so much from them. I had a great mentor and boss at the time who was the co-founder of Full Contact, a guy named Travis Todd. And he was the one who really helped me navigate that role change and transition into this growth role. He's a very experienced and talented growth practitioner himself. So he was kind of a great Sherpa for navigating that, so to speak. And what were some of the things, maybe one thing that he helped you navigate as part of that? He really helped me figure out how to prioritize growth opportunities. I was younger and super eager at the time, and I wanted to just dive right in and do everything from acquisition to monetization to retention. And I was like, everything's broken. We got to fix it all, all at once. And he's like, all right, let's slow down a bit. Let's actually prioritize what our most impactful areas that we could work on. So he really taught me how to do that. I feel like so many people never really get a good mentor. And so you kind of struggle and suffer silently. And so it's nice that you got one earlier on in your career. I know that it hasn't been always the easiest journey. And so I'm interested to know in those early days, if there was a mistake or a misstep that you took that you could share with us. One that definitely sticks out was even before my time at Full Contact, I was in an interim role working on growth marketing. And since this was an interim role and I wasn't going to stay on full time forever, I was tasked with creating my secession plan and also just figuring out staffing for the team. And one of those hires did not go right. It felt like a real fail, a total blow to my ego at the time. And I just kept racking my brain for what could I have done better? What went wrong? Luckily, I was working with an amazing CMO at the time. She took the blame for it. She did not fault me for it. And I think what we came down to was like we hadn't done enough interviewing on like the culture side of it to make sure that this person really wanted the role. They definitely got the role, but did they really want it? At the end of the day, I'm not sure that was a good fit there. 
it's taught me a lot about hiring and just how to have a better process for the hiring process. And today I'd like to think that's one of my superpowers, but I don't think I would think that unless I'd been through that failure. And how do you define failed hire? Because I feel like there are going to be folks who are listening to this who are thinking probably a bunch of different things in their head. What does that mean to you? There's a bunch of different ways a hire can go wrong. But in this case, the person didn't even really want to onboard and get into the role. Like starting on day one, they just weren't excited about it. We weren't getting a lot of feedback from them even in their first week. And so at the end of the week, we're just like, is this working? Like, do they want this role? (laughs) What went wrong? And did that surprise you based on the interview process? Yeah, totally. During the interview process, they told us that they were a super fan of the brand. They were really excited to work on this. And then maybe something changed in their situation. I don't think we ever really dug into that after we parted ways. But it was just like night and day from the interview process to their start date. I feel like interviewing and hiring are so tough to suss out because sometimes you have incredibly talented people that aren't great interviewers. And then you have amazing interviewers that might not be world-class in terms of their talent and their execution and their operating style. Is there a learning here? Yeah, for me, I've definitely adapted my hiring process and my interview process coming out of that. I focus a lot more on the culture piece of it now and making sure the person not only gets the role and has the skill set for it, but that they want it and they're eager to dive into it. I think the other piece that I learned coming out of this too, you mentioned not everyone does really well in interviews. And this person did really well on the verbal communication skills. This might just be because I've primarily worked at remote companies, but now I focus a lot more on the async side of it and what kind of async interviews can we do? So, you know, we're not just taking what they tell us at face value in a one-to-one conversation. All that makes sense to me. And as I'm just reflecting, listening to you, I feel like one of the challenges that I've had throughout my career is when I became a manager and when I became a hiring manager, every time something happened with my team or something happened with a person on my team, or when there was tough feedback from another manager to a person on my team, I took it as a hit to my ego and my identity. And I felt that personal failure. And I'm curious, does that resonate with you? Or is that just me? Am I like a super feeler? No, totally. Yeah. I took it as like, am I even good at this job? It knocked me down more than a few pegs. (laughs) Yeah. And I would imagine it would for me too. Like as I'm listening to this, I'm like, man, if that happened to me and it's early in my journey in the growth space and as a leader, I don't know that I could have shaken it off. I feel like it might've stayed with me a little bit. It did stay with me to the point where I think I was a little bit hesitant to do hiring rounds after that. And I was just super cautious and probably spent more time than I needed to, to like structure them in a well-formatted way. I was so lucky to be working with this amazing CMO at the time who I had a relationship with before I started at the company. She and I had worked together before. Luckily, we already had some of that rapport and she knew that I was not a total failure and that this was just a mistake that can happen. And we navigated it, luckily. And so what does navigating it look like? So you had the hire a week in, things aren't going so well. Then what happens? Do you rehire? Do you hire the person? Does the CMO take over the hiring? Like what happened after that? We did go back to the drawing board and say, okay, what could have gone better in the hiring process? So we talked about the culture interviews that we should have done. I think it was because we were so desperate at the time to just get somebody in. So we're like, all right, let's just make sure they've got the skills. A classic early stage mistake, right? You're like, oh, by the time we get the rec approved, we really needed them three months ago. We desperately need them now. We kind of just need to find someone and get going. And I feel like that's a mistake I hear about all the time. Yeah. And I think the other thing that I failed to mention was that We hadn't actually done a reference check. That just seems like such a no-brainer. We went back to the drawing board and we're like, we got to do these culture interviews. We got to do the reference checks. And so we started the process again. And I think we realized we needed to slow down and not get excited about any one candidate too quickly. Yeah, that's great advice. When I worked at Postscript, they used to say the reference check is the most important part of the interview. And that was different than maybe what I had thought before that I had hired before that. And a reference check really was a checkpoint just to be checked off on the list unless there was a red flag versus at PostScript, they really used it as a round of the interview process. I think that's a good process to me. I hadn't even thought about before I started there. And it sounds like that was similar to the learning that you got here. So your growth story continues on. You work at Fold, you work at Whimsical, you've been at some high growth companies. And I'm curious to know, because 
Everyone who works in growth, you want to work at a winner, right? A big part of your identity is when you work in growth to work at one of these high growth companies with a ton of users and this crazy funnel. And I talk to a lot of folks who finally get an opportunity like that and then feel like they don't deserve to be there or that they're surrounded by all these amazing people and that really they just interviewed well and that they're not sure what to do. Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever felt that? Probably at every role, to be honest with you. But I think more so than anywhere at Whimsical, I felt like that coming in just because it was such a team of high performers. I'm joining the company and there's people who were early at Dropbox. One of the designers who's an absolute rock star that I got to work with, he was like early Zapier and Twilio. So I was like, these guys have name brands on their resume. Like I've worked at a few early startups. What do I have to offer? So I definitely felt that imposter syndrome on day one. <laughs> the companies that you listed off are some of the bigger Silicon Valley companies. And we're both on the East Coast. You're in Virginia. I'm in Massachusetts. There is a little bit of a thing when you start to get to work with people that are from the West Coast where it seems more intimidating. Is that just me projecting or did you feel that too? No, I totally felt that pressure as well. I think just because we don't have the culture of Silicon Valley on the East Coast, you know, maybe unless you're like in New York, I think it just adds to the imposter syndrome. You're like, okay, they're going to think I'm like from the middle of nowhere. What are they going to think of me going in? What are these preconceived notions? So you're there, you're feeling uncomfortable, you're getting to know your colleagues. They're all these impressive people from impressive companies, but you didn't leave. So how did you find your way through that? How do you navigate that for anyone who's listening to this that might be going through a similar situation? I would say I did have the advantage when I started at Wind School and that I had worked with a lot of these folks before. So the team that had brought me on, I had worked with many of them at the startup that I mentioned earlier called Full Contact. I wasn't coming in blind and not having worked with the team. So I did have some rapport with these folks and had an existing relationship with them. So that definitely helped. But just in navigating like these new relationships and learning how my new coworkers worked, it took some time. We had to build trust. We had to get to know one another. And it certainly wasn't easy. It took a lot of spending time with one another. And is there a process or anything that you followed? How did you do that? So you get in there, you meet these people, you know, hey, I've got to build trust. I've got to get to know them on a personal level. How do you go about doing that as a new employee, as these people come in and they become the new employees, but you still feel the same way? I would say in a remote setting, it's really hard to make the time and space for that and be really intentional about it. But I mean, being proactive and setting up those check-ins, those one-on-ones and making sure they're happening on a recurring basis. This is something that I did not do well at Whimsical, but I wish I had done, is actually not being afraid to bring up the elephants in the room, being bold and saying what's on your mind and calling out what might be working or not working, just to build that trust and show like, hey, I'm being honest and vulnerable with you here. I think that's something that can work to the advantage too, especially in a remote setting. Can you give an example of that that comes to mind? When I started at Whimsical, I was being brought on to this leadership team. It was a primarily a European leadership team, which was new for me. And I hadn't worked with many of the folks on the leadership team. So that was something that was unique there. I will say too, it was also my first time working with a technical founder, which I'd previously worked with like sales and marketing founders. It was really hard to navigate it. I feel like I didn't do enough to build trust with our CEO early on. I wish I had. He's an incredibly talented guy and I respect the hell out of him. I wish that there had been more of those honest conversations up front so that we could have gotten better aligned. And I'm sure that there are folks listening to this who work for a technical founder nodding along, smiling in the way that I am. What would you do differently if you could go back and to be that new employee again? And I'm asking this just so for anyone listening to this, who's like, man, I work at a company like this. I work for a small company. We're growing fast. I work for a technical founder. And they're just wondering if there's something different that they could do. I would say you've been brought on for a reason. They hired you for your expertise. So don't doubt it. It's okay to be honest and have those hard conversations up front. And you have to have them or you're never going to build enough trust. So that's something that I wish I would have done rather than just coming in and being like, oh, I got to get some quick wins under my belt and kind of just shooting from the hip to get something done to show that I can make progress. I definitely think I would have stepped back and had more of those conversations up front about like, okay, what do we want to achieve? What's keeping us from growing today? And just calling out things that I saw that might have been hindering growth as well. And you've mentioned trust a few different times in this convo. Do you view building trust as one of the key skills that someone who works in roles like ours needs to be successful? 
Yeah. There's so many different areas and facets of growth that you can work on. You can work on acquisition, monetization, activation and retention. And I think you have to build that trust so that when you go to make that recommendation of this is what we need to focus on, or we need to redefine our activation metric. When you go to recommend something like that, you have the rapport with the founder, whoever you're reporting to, so that they can say, okay, I'm going to back this plan that you have and get behind it and we'll see where it goes. It's hard, right? I feel like a lot of the job is finding opportunities and fixing things that are broken. And sometimes that's uncomfortable, whether that's leaning over and saying, hey, I see this thing that you haven't asked me to look at, but I've been analyzing things and I can't ignore it. I think this is something we need to fix. Or it's bringing up things that are maybe different than what your founder thinks and what your CEO thinks. They might have a hypothesis that's like, hey, we need to fix this thing. And you might see the opposite of that. And so I feel like a big part of the job is being able to build trust, and then have those difficult conversations. That really resonates to me as someone who chats with folks like you all the time. I got to ask, so what's the lowest point that you've had in your growth career? These are tough jobs at early stage companies that are unstable. What's been the hardest chapter for you? I might have a little bit of recency bias here since I've been at Whimsical for almost two years now. But I would say, going back to this example of building rapport with the CEO and the leadership team early on, at one point, we took a step back and said, is this working? We're trying to build a GTM team and sales motion while we're also getting a product team started from scratch while we're also trying to build a growth team from scratch. Is this working? To me, that was like the lowest point of my career because I had to put my ego aside and say, this isn't working. We're trying to do too many things at once. I don't know if we're ready for a centralized growth team or if that even makes sense for the business. So while, yes, that looks good for my resume, I didn't know if it was right for the team or the business. So it definitely felt like a low point where I had to start having those hard conversations with our CRO, our VP of product, and say, I don't know if we need a head of growth. Should I be reporting to one of you? Should I be in a different role? That was really tough. And what's the context of when this happens? How big is the company? How many people are there? Just to give a little bit more background for folks listening. We had raised our Series A and started hiring, as you do. We had brought in a CRO who had started building up this go-to-market team. And same on the product side, too. We had started hiring product managers and more engineers to put the fuel on the fire. So I want to say at the time, the team was maybe 30 or 40 people when we started to like have these growing pains. And we'd had enough time for these teams to bake in to say, like, is this working? Are metrics moving the way that we need them to? Is the team operating the way it should be right now? And at this time, are you reporting directly to the CEO? Yes, at the time I was. And then they've got a CRO who's probably thinking about sales and customer success in addition to pricing, packaging, things like that. So is that sort of the relationship that's going on? Yeah, totally. What goes through your mind when you have that convo? To be honest with you, I was just like, am I not doing a good job in this role? Like, is that the reason why the growth team is just not getting off the ground? And it was really tough to like face those decisions and discussions with myself even. It was a really hard time, just again, for my ego to say, do I want to be ahead of growth? Does Whimsical need ahead of growth? And at the end of the day, I think I knew all along, this isn't really the right time for Whimsical to have this dedicated growth team. And for me to scale up the team, it just doesn't make sense when we're like still getting our product team off the ground. And we have a PLG motion at the end of the day that just came up organically. Maybe we need to invest more in that and understanding those loops and where the opportunities are rather than just having this siloed, dedicated growth team. And so in retrospect, do you think it was just too soon? I think it was too soon. And I think that having three leadership hires in such a short amount of time did not really set up growth for where it needed to be. So if we had said, we're going to bring on this growth team and it's going to be centralized and we're going to structure it this way and here's how they're going to operate alongside the product team, I think it could have worked. But having that alongside the go-to-market team being built at the same time, the product team, it didn't make sense. I'm nodding along because as an advisor, I oftentimes talk myself out of a job all the time, actually. Where folks will reach out to me and they'll say, hey, could you come on and help us. We're looking to do X, Y, and Z. And a lot of times I think it's too soon. And I think that this is one of those things that you don't know until you've been through it. It's a frustrating experience in a hit to the ego. I would feel the exact same way. If you work at one of these companies, it's like, it's just a little bit too soon to be having growth here. 
we need to really figure out product market fit and set up some of our core capabilities before we have someone come in and question everything and break through plateaus and all that stuff. And so I find myself talking founders out of it a lot of the time. And that's really, it sounds like what you went through as well, although you were just in-house. I find myself in the same position now where I'm talking people out of it <laughs> or anyone. I'm like, are you ready for a head of growth? Do you need a growth team yet? <laughs> Maybe you need more of your foundations in place and to find product market fit. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. So what happens after this? So you have this conversation, you shared that you immediately felt like it was you. So you work through those feelings. It's obviously not you. It's the situation was just not the right company need slash individual skill set fit or like team capability need fit. What happens after that? I put my ego aside and ended up transitioning into a product role, which was scary, daunting. And I was really unsure about it going into it. I remember you and I were working together at the time and we had a lot of conversations where I was just having so much self-doubt. I'm going from a people management role, building and setting the strategy to more of an individual contributor. Am I going to be able to do a good job in this? And it really worked out. I still got to work on a facet of growth. So I was brought in to be a PM on a growth focused team focused on integrations. And luckily, it was like a really high performing team. And, and I feel like it was a lot better suited for me and for what Whimsical needed at the time. So it ended up being a really good fit. You came from the marketing side of growth originally. And then I know that you reported to a PM for a little while. And then you went back to like head of growth in marketing at Whimsical. Do you think going back and getting more product management experience ultimately helps you in the long term? I totally do. The way that I position myself is that I want to work with companies that have a product-led motion. That's how they grow. And so obviously, the more product experience I can get and deeper product experience can only help. And I certainly think it did. I was able to work alongside really seasoned engineers and designers as well. And I feel like they helped me level up that skill set too. And objectively, I would just add to that one of the challenges that marketers have when they break into the more cross-functional world of growth is that they can't work with engineers or engineers need them to work in a way that they have trouble understanding or adapting to. I may be a little bit biased, but I think that'll be a superpower for you down the road, regardless if you're the person doing the product managing or managing someone who's doing some of that work. I think this skill set is a good experience to have. Yeah, I totally agree with you on that. And so you're right in the middle of this nonlinear career path. Just the other week, I had Adam Fishman on who I know that you know, he's an instructor at Reforge amongst many other impressive things that he's done. And he shared this. He shared how his career path was nonlinear and that he had a bunch of bumps and bruises in times when he got outside of his comfort zone and even had bad performance reviews. And so I think when something like this happens or their career path has a step sideways, just a different direction than up and to the right, that they get in their head and they get nervous and they think, oh no, it's me, I'm screwing up, I wasn't made to do this. This is just part of the journey. And one of the things that I'm really impressed of is that you've been able to put your personal feelings aside and just prioritize what's best for the business. And I'm curious to know, how do you do that? Is there a framework or a thing that you think about that helps you to compartmentalize this stuff so that it doesn't become an illness that infects you and that you carry with you? One of the things that I try to do and the way I try to approach work is be like bamboo, bend, but don't break. I'm here to help grow the business. So I need to be flexible to the needs of the business and not let it cut me down. Even if it's like not the right role or the right time, I need to be able to adapt to it. So that's something that I try to keep in mind. Going through this experience at Whimsical, I had always gotten like positive feedback. So I was like, okay, I know it's not me. I'm still a capable individual. I'm not a total failure. <laughs> so I think like also having those indicators too certainly helped to just not get stuck in this bad headspace where I'm like, oh, I'm not even cut out for growth. I shouldn't be doing this anymore. <laughs> yeah, I was curious to know if you had ever felt that. Sometimes I'll chat with people who are like, man, I'm at this inflection point and I'm either going to double down and just try to power through or I'm going to give up this tech thing and go become a barista or something like that. Have you ever felt that? Have you ever gotten to that point? Oh, yeah. I've had conversations with my husband where I'm like, you know, I think I'm just going to become a fishmonger. I'm done with computers. <laughs> <But> <laughs> At the end of the day, I love mentoring people who work on this stuff. So I always come back to it. For someone who maybe because of the economy or company changes, but they're going through a similar situation where they're being asked to take a step in a slightly different direction than they anticipated their career. What's one piece of advice that you'd share with them? 
I would just say to like, keep in mind, careers aren't linear. Look at all these proof points that you have that they're not. Just keep that in perspective and just keep a positive mindset about it and see it as a growth opportunity for yourself and don't focus on the negatives. And then one other question as we start to wrap up here. I'm curious from your perspective as an experienced growth operator, why do you think the head of growth role turns over so often? Honestly, I feel like there's just such a misalignment and misunderstanding for what growth is. As a head of growth, you really have to be able to like suss out these opportunities in that interview process and know what you're getting into. I've talked to companies that are hiring for a head of growth. I'm like, this isn't even a growth role. What you need is a product marketer, for example. And I'll tell them that in the interview process because interview processes are a two-way street, right? I'm interviewing them just as much as they're interviewing me. So I think that feedback's valuable for them. Getting back to it, I think just a misalignment on what the role even is. And in the interview process too, just not getting a good enough understanding of is the company at a point where they're even ready for a head of growth? Do they need a head of growth? That's great advice because normally interviews, you go, you talk to someone for a half an hour the first time in the last one minute, they're like, hey, what questions do you have? And you're like really just trying to sell yourself to get to the next round. When do you think is the most appropriate time to suss out some of that stuff? I think you have to go with your intuition on that when it feels right. You've built a little bit of rapport with the hiring manager, hopefully, before you start bringing things like that up. Once you get to a later stage, it's fair game to bring that up. And it's totally fine to call your own interview too, right? If you don't have a great idea yet that it's going to be a good fit, that they need a head of growth, that they're aligned on what the role even is and all the surface areas that you're going to be working on, totally fair to call your own interview with the hiring manager or other people that you think are going to have influence over growth. I think that's one of the savviest plays. Call your own round. It's crazy the amount of questions and time that they spend getting to vet you. And it's just as important to your life and your happiness and your personal career and your success to find the right company fit for you too. So that's great advice. Have you actually done that before? I have gotten better about it recently. But I think I might have learned that from either you or Elena Berna. But yeah, I think it's incredibly important. I would also say too, like talk to people who have also worked at the company or left recently. If you're being interviewed as like a backfill for a former head of growth or head of marketing or some kind of tangential role, do the research and seek out that person and get the scoop on what things are like. Because, you know, a company is going to try to sell you on who they are and what they're doing, but it might be different when you actually get into the role. So that's the other piece of advice I would give. That's great advice. Do a reference check in the same way the company's doing a reference check for you. And earlier in our conversation, you shared how important the reference check has proven to be in the interview process. It would make sense as you interview the company to do the same thing. That's great advice. Yeah, totally. Thank you for coming on and sharing your story and your journey and your experience. For folks that are listening to this that want to interact and connect with you, where should we send them? Folks are welcome to reach out to me on LinkedIn if they have questions or need advice. I think my URL on LinkedIn is just Hillary PM, so you can find me there. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to the pod. I hope that you enjoyed the episode. If you did, the biggest gift that you could give me as a small business owner and as a content creator would be a review. You know the game. You can go on to Apple Podcasts. You can go on Spotify. Leave a review. That would help me service this content to other folks who are like you. Obviously, you should subscribe to the content if you really dug it. And if there's feedback that you have for me, folks you think I should chat with, stuff that you wish I would gloss over faster, whatever it is, I'm all ears. I work in growth. You're not going to hurt my feelings. I try to collect feedback and iterate quickly. You can reach out to me on LinkedIn at Andrew Kaplan or on Twitter at at A Kaplan. Hope you enjoyed the episode and I'll see you next show.